Our lessons uh, for today talk about the fact that there are key decision points in our lives. Key decision points when we have to decide what's going to be the, the power that guides us. What's going to be the force that really shapes us and determines what path we will take and who we will be. Think about every day there are all kinds of things that influence us. There's all, there's all kinds of powers, forces that work in the world that influence who we are. Um, we go, God gives us freedom of choice. God gives us free will. So we make decisions. But there's other things that really shape us and influence us. So uh, the family that we were born into, our family of origin, that certainly uh, plays a part in who we grow up to be and so forth. Or uh, in the world, our society, peer pressure, uh, social messages, all the advertising, uh, that shapes who we're going to be. Or our fears, the fears we have will oftentimes shape how we go through the day. Or our hopes, what we hope for, will often be a main influence. Or just world events in general. So there's all these powers, there's all these influences, there's all these forces at work. But the question is, what or who ultimately is truly going to fill us and shape who we will be? That message comes up in the Old Testament lesson, the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua, who, when Moses died, became the leader of the people of Israel. Uh, the people of Israel are finally ready to enter into the Promised Land. Forty years previously, God had freed them from slavery in Egypt, and then for 40 years they had traveled through the wilderness, and they finally get there. They get right on the border of entering into Israel, the land that they've been longing to, and Joshua gathers them all together and says to them, We're, this is going to be a new day. We're starting out all over again. But you need to choose whom you're going to serve. And what he was talking about, which God, which God will you serve? Which God will you allow to be the force and the power in your life that really guides you as a people? Because the, the children of Israel had literally, literally accumulated all kinds of gods as they traveled along. Gods represented by idols or by religious practices. Uh, they had them as part of their baggage. They had, uh, even though they worshipped the Lord God who freed them, they also had brought with them some of the gods from Egypt. They had picked up some different gods along the way as they traveled through the land of the Amorites and the Ammonites and so forth. So Joshua says to them, we're starting out fresh today in the new land. Choose which god are you going to serve? Who is going to be the force that guides you? Who is going to be the one, the power that influences who you are? And then the gospel lesson, Jesus puts the same question to the disciples, only a little bit different way. It, when we read the gospels, it becomes clear that it wasn't only the 12 disciples, the ones that we know as the 12 apostles who followed Jesus, they were the inner core, but literally hundreds of people, particularly in the, in the early months and the first couple of years of Jesus' ministry, two or three hundred people might be following him from one city to the next, particularly when they were up in the in the, his home region of Galilee. So Jesus had a big following. But as people stayed with them, and they heard more of his teaching, and as they saw how he devoted his life entirely to God, people started to get a little bit nervous. This was complicated stuff. This was, risky, this was a risky thing to entrust your life to God as Jesus did. And so people began to drop away. People began to decide it wasn't so smart to follow Jesus after all. And it's at that point in the Gospel lesson that Jesus turns to his 12 disciples and says to them, Do you wish to go away also? And that's when Simon Peter says back, Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the one who have the words of eternal life. You are the one that reveals to us the power by which we want to live. Those words, you may have noticed, are the words in our liturgy. We sing them every Sunday. The Alleluia verse just before the Gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's a quote from Peter. And it's a quote from Peter. But again, it's a decision point. Who is the one that we go to? Which is the power that we follow? Who has the real source of life that we want to entrust our lives to? In the history of the Christian church, there's a, a great example of a person who was able to turn his life completely over to God, let God be the power and the guide that guided him no matter what. And that example is uh, St. Brendan of Ireland. I didn't know a lot about St. Brendan of Ireland until I came upon, came upon this account of his life. 
But Brendan was uh, an Irish priest, an Irish monk, that was born in Ireland in the year 488 and lived until the year 577. So he lived to be 89 years old, which was a remarkably long life in those days. And Brendan, as a monk and a priest, just wasn't, didn't just stay in one spot. He traveled, as the Irish monks did, he traveled to many different places as a missionary of the news of Jesus Christ. In those centuries, in the 400s and the 500s and the 600s, uh, Christianity was in a very vulnerable position. Christianity was actually sort of dying out in much of uh, Western and Northern Europe. When the Roman Empire, the Christianized Roman Empire of Constantinople began to disintegrate, the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity began to disintegrate too, and other religions took over many, uh, many nations in Europe, Northern Europe. And it was really the Irish monks that saved Christianity in those days. It was the Irish monks, the Irish priests that traveled out from Ireland on missionary journeys that kept Christianity alive in Europe for over a, a period of five or six hundred years. And that was what Brendan did. During the whole first part of his ministry, Brendan uh, got on board boats and traveled up and down the coast of Europe and entered in and preached and established monasteries and kept the Christian church alive. And uh, into the places that we now know today as France and the Netherlands and Scandinavia. And it was the Christian monks like Brendan that kept Christianity alive. Well, when Brendan uh, reached the age of 70, he embarked on the most fantastic voyage of his whole lifetime. And that is, he, he gathered together uh, 17 other Irish monks, and they all got into little boats called coracles, and they set out from the west coast of Ireland, going west this time out into the Atlantic Ocean. A coracle, I never knew this until I researched a little bit, a coracle is a small, round, completely round boat. Think of a, think of a soup bowl, a soup bowl that's 10 feet across. And the, the structure of the soup bowl is made up of, of tree limbs that have been cut and kind of fashioned, kind of bent to make the roundness of the boat and then bent on the other side and tied together. And around this structure of tree limbs, they fastened on uh, uh, cow, uh, cow skin. What's the word I'm looking for? Cowhide, thank you. They fastened on, they sewed together pieces of cowhide and stretched it over this wooden structure. And that was the hull of the boat. And so Brendan and his 17 other brothers got into these little, um, into these little coracles and one day just pushed off from the western edge of Ireland and they decided that they would go wherever the wind blew them. Now they believed that God directed the winds and so they were gonna let God direct them because these God-driven winds would take them wherever God wanted them to go. Well, where did they go? They, they kept some journals and they reported the story. So we know that first they sailed from Ireland to Iceland, to the coast of Iceland. They said that when they got to Iceland, they observed uh, undersea volcanoes uh, spewing up fire and lava from the ocean floor, adding on to the coastline of Ireland. They were there for a bit, and then the winds blew them further west, and it blew them through uh, pods, herds of whales that would come up and check out these funny little round boats they were seeing. In fact, they said that some of the whales would actually pick up one of their coracles on its back and would let it sail along with them away. And for the, beyond that, the wind kept blowing them west until finally they reached what we know of as North America. But in their journals, they called it the promised land of the saints. And for seven years, the wind just took these coracles up and down the east coast of North America and they would land ashore, and they would discover what was there, and they would preach the good news to whoever they encountered at that time. And then after seven years, the wind shifted and actually blew the coracle boats back to Ireland, and they all retired there. 